Welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon. Um, talk about fundamentals with electrical troubleshooting for irrigation pros. It's gonna be put on by primarily Dave Mahalik, who is our field service manager in the Midwest, as well with maybe a little additions uh, put in by Chris Russo, who is our field service manager out of the Northeast. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand it on over to Dave Mahalik. Hi guys, thanks for coming. So I'm gonna talk to you today about the, just some basic troubleshooting for for irrigation. This is uh, real entry level type stuff, um, but I think it's something that a lot of us need a refresher on. So it's gonna be basically two sections to it. The one I'm gonna talk about the different types of electrical circuits you can run into, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the time on how to how to use the voltmeter to troubleshoot irrigation things. So the kinds of circuits that we see are what, what's referred to as an open circuit, a closed circuit, a short circuit, a series circuit, and a parallel circuit. Now I'll go on to each one of these and explain a little bit more. So an open circuit is basically that. It's just like this slide showing. It's, a, it's an incomplete circuit. In other words, it's a broken wire. It's a, it's a, a connector that's fallen off. There's, for some reason, there's not a complete path to the load and back to the source. That's, that's what we call an open circuit. We hear this called a short all the time, but this isn't actually a short, this is an open. A, a, a closed circuit or a complete circuit is a circuit that has, doesn't have any breaks in the connection. In other words, it comes from the, from the source through whatever the load is and back. That's, a, that's what's called a closed circuit or a complete circuit. Now a shorted circuit is exactly that. It's shorted. The two wires are touching each other, or the, whatever the component is is just melted inside, and it's it's effective, effectively shorted to each other. But that's what a short actually is. A short's two basically two wires touching each other. Now a series circuit, and this is a pretty good example of the series circuit, is it's 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 daisy chained. In other words, the the wire goes from one one device to the next and then back. And this is a this was, is a very good example of where you would use a series circuit. On uh, on some of us the smaller controllers they only have one sensor input, but if you have two sensors, you can hook the sensors in series and it, and it still works. So if either one of these goes active, it'll disable the controller. A parallel circuit looks like this. A parallel circuits what most AC circuits are. The Multiple things are attached. This is like lights in your house are all attached to the same two wires. Um, this would be also referred to as daisy chain. This is not daisy chain. This is this is parallel. That's daisy chain when it's in one and out the other. You got it. Like I say, this is the, if you have two solenoids and to run off one station, that's how they'd be wired. Um, the lights in your house are wired this way. Almost anything that's on a on an AC circuit is wired in parallel, not in series. So now we'll talk about about using voltmeters um, and, and and the things we do with voltmeters. And they're looking. We're looking. going to look at DC voltage or direct current, AC voltage or alternating current, resistance which was measured in ohms continuity which is which is basically a diff, a, a form of resistance checking and, and amperage was measuring the flow of electricity so we use this analogy a lot to, to try to explain or to simplify electricity and electrical stuff so volts in an electrical system are like water pressure pressure in a hydraulic system it's the force that drives everything. Ohms are fri like friction loss or the resistance to flow. Um, and amps are actually the result of volts and ohms, or they're the actual flow in, in an electrical system. It's the flow of, of uh, electrons down the wire, where in, in, a, in a hydraulic system, it's the flow of water through a pipe.
So we'll go to, to DC voltage and measuring DC voltage. Like I say, DC, DC means direct current. And in direct current, we have, we have electric flow in one direction only. In other words, that's why it's called direct. In this case, it would be a negative flow, or this would be a positive flow. Now, when you're checking DC voltage, one of the things you got to watch for is you, you, you got to learn to know your meters. Um, there's there's a ton of different voltmeters out there. They're all they all laid out, and you got to watch what you're doing. And in the case of this one here, this V with the line and the three dots is DC voltage and it also will read pulsating DC voltage or square waves. The, the three dots are for, for pulsing, but for the most part in irrigation, we don't use that. Um, but you do need, if you're like, and the main thing you're gonna be checking on DC is, is battery voltage, whether it's batteries in your, in your um, handheld radio or your node, um, whatever. Um, that's basically that's what DC voltage is, is voltage that comes from a battery. And folks, notes on your multimeters. There's uh, if you don't have the AC and DC functions, there's a selection switch on some of the um, more advanced meters where you actually have to switch between DC and AC. So, like Dave said, know the meter you're using. And they're all yeah, and they're all different. Um, some of, some of them will, will be able to tell the difference between AC and DC. Most don't, you'll have to select it. Some can cha change ranges for you. All you gotta do is tell it AC and it'll know what to, it'll know, it'll do everything from there. Others, you're gonna have to select a range. Like in this case, we needed to tell it the 20 volt range. And typically, you're gonna set the range to the next number higher than the voltage you expect. So if you're looking at a, at a at a little battery and it's 1.5, you don't want to pick the 300 volt range. It won't even probably read it at that point. Pick the low the the number that's the next higher than what you expect. So if you had a, a 12 volt battery and a 10 volt setting on your meter, you wouldn't pick 10. You'd pick whatever was next. Yeah, some auto ranging meters will pick the the scale for you and do that for you. And obviously, a less expensive meter, you're going to have to have a little bit more information about what you're testing. Yeah, like the meter I use is auto ranging. I'm sure the one Chris does too. But there's lots of them out there that aren't. They're perfectly fine for this this purpose, but you just need to know. So this is just checking the voltage on a on a on a battery. Um, notice according to which way I have the leads what my reading is. So, and we're talking, and, the, and it's showing you that the top one is regular polarity. In other words, we got the polarity right with the meter leaps. Black on a meter means it's common or it's a negative. And, and the, the slide, and down here, this is, this is just if we have the wires reversed. What happened? The battery's doing it. Go ahead. No, Dave, I was gonna say, what's gonna happen if you switch them the wrong way? It's just, you're just gonna get a, you're just gonna, if you have them backwards, you're going to get a negative reading on, right. on your meter. It's still nine. It's still nine point six volts. It's just you have the leads wrong. Is all. No, polarity no matters. Polarity matters when you're when you're testing DC voltage and AC. A lot of times it does not matter. Right. And, and so, so AC voltage. Uh, alternating current, basically alternating current means it's going to go back from north or from positive to negative. Positive to negative. And it's actually going to do this typically 60 times a second or 60 hertz. So when you're checking AC voltage, just like when we check DC, we need to make sure our meter is set to the proper range and to the proper voltage. Um, and again, same thing, we wanna set it to a, a, a number that's higher, just the, the next number higher than what we expect. So if you're checking line voltage like here, and then you got a, 200, a 20 and a 200 range, we wanna to go to 200, because 200 is more than the 120 we expect. But you gotta make sure that your, like AC voltage is usually a little squiggly line, um, or, a, or a, I hear people call it a worm. Um, 
So you make sure if you're doing AC, you need to set your meter to AC, not DC, and your range to a, a number higher than what you expect to see. So in this case, we'd set it to 200 on either of these meters. And obviously, if you're testing anything that's bigger than the 120 volts that we typically get on our plugs at our houses where the controllers are plugged in, if you're working on a pump, you could be dealing with 240, um, and that's a different, uh, and that's another setting higher than where we're at now. It's just an example of checking voltage. Um, it's checking on the transformer of a controller. So we're just going to put one meter on on AC1 and one meter on AC2 and get a reading. We can also check the check for voltage, and, and this is pretty common to do, is check for the voltage on the station. We're just going to turn the station on, hook the leads to common in that station. Again, this is AC voltage, so the, the, the polarity of the leads doesn't matter. Red can go on either, black can go on either. Um, most, most technicians just make it a habit to always put black to common. That way you don't make a mistake someday down the road. But you don't right. have to do it. But that, trip, that trips up a lot of people when they're using multimeters because they're afraid to put the leads. And nine times out of ten, we're, we're testing AC voltage. So um, just know that, you know, you can reverse the leads. It's not going to be it's not going to be a, a, the end of the day for you. <laughs> you say polarity doesn't matter when you're testing AC circuits. It should read when you're checking on when you're checking the, the station, it should read just about exactly the same as what the what you read on the transformer on the AC1 and AC2. Um, should not be very any difference hardly at all there. So you can check any station and and a lot of times when we're when we're checking, we'll we'll check every station on the controller. We'll just turn it on, touch touch a lead to it and see what we get. And they should be the same. Each station should have a similar reading. If they didn't have a similar reading, if you had one that was significantly lower, it probably indicates a short or a problem out in the field that's drawing it down. And then so in that case, you remove the remove the station wire and retest the uh, terminal on the controller to rule the controller out. Right. If the reading was still bad, it would tell you you have a controller problem, but usually if that's the case, it's going to tell you you got a field problem. And the other thing that we check at sometimes, um, a lot of times this would be if, if you have a symptoms of extra stations running or stations running when they shouldn't, is turn on one station and check for voltage on the others. Um, it, could be, it could be feedback from a short in the field, it could be feedback from it could be a problem in the controller itself and then again it would be the same thing you just connect the wire and see what happens to the reading at that point and, and so if you if you a little life hack for you too if you happen to have a hunter cylinder that you can uh, put on these terminals if you don't have your multimeter with you you can um, you can determine whether or not the station is produ producing voltage by just tapping the solenoid onto the uh, terminal yeah, and it's actually something I carry with me always as a, a solenoid. I actually just have alligator clips on it that I use for, I can use it for that purpose. If, like say, if you don't have a meter or if you want to prove that the controller works, you hook your solenoid up. Um, it, works in a, it certainly works in a pinch. So now as far as resistance and like resistance or, or and we measure resistance in ohms, is the resistance to electrical flow is what we're talking about. So one thing that we want to get, make sure we get across to you first, when you're checking ohms with a voltmeter, with a multimeter, always turn the power off first. Um, depending on the meter, a lot of meters you will damage it. If you'll either blow the fuse, you could completely destroy the meter. And, it, and it, even if that's not the case, you will get false readings. The way that the way an ohm meter works, when it when it when we're testing for resistance, it induces a voltage onto the onto the meter leads, and we use that to determine what the resistance is. So if it, it sees voltage there anyways, you're going to get a, you're going to get a false reading. So just always remember that if you're doing if you're checking resistance, turn the power off first. 
so so on, on this meter's case when we're more, and when we're checking for, for checking resistance, especially checking solenoids or transformers, which we don't do a real lot, but they're, these kinds of things have pretty low ohm readings typically. So we want to set our set our meter to probably the lowest range. And again, it's the same thing. We want to set it. We don't want to set it to a range that's lower than what we expect, but we want to set it to usually it's the lowest range the, the meter has. Yeah, for irrigation troubleshooting, we're usually down in that uh, six o'clock range yeah. on that meter. It'll just depend on you know, and, and like I say, every meter's every meter's different. The the locations on the dials and the numbers on the dials are all going to vary. But typically, it's the lowest reading you get. You just take and hook it up to whatever you're reading to a solenoid or to the terminal strip of the controller, and it's going to give you a reading. The the reading and oh yeah the this this sign here omega is the, the that's the re, that's ohm that's the ohm sign so that's what you're looking for on your meters the upside down horseshoe for lack of a better term and then you're going to get a reading and this is a pretty this is a normal reading it's actually a, the, a normal reading for for an old hunter solenoid um the, the newer ones have a slightly different reading and you'll see it in some of the other slides but and the, the one thing that we try to get through to people is um every every i think we'll go to there oh yeah so so in this in that in this one's case if you see if you see this it's telling you that you got an, an open some control a lot of meters will it'll, if you don't have a connection it'll the screen will say ol or overload um it could they just vary you just need to know like i say it's another case where you need to know what your meter does it's and again, real, this meter is probably an uh, inexpensive one, and it's not telling yeah. you anything that uh, you would understand. It's just giving you a, a basically a, a decimal point, and you need to know that that means that it's, uh, it's an open yeah, line. Yeah, that's an open line or an over, overload. It's, it's, it doesn't know. It can't read that. So, so just some, just these are some, just just some general rule for resistance of solenoids, and and we use and we use resistance to check solenoids a lot. So, so here's the rule of thumb, and, and believe me, there's some exceptions here. There's a lot of variation in solenoids, manufacturer to manufacturer, and, and in different applications, and we'll try to show you some of that. So the way we look at it, if you read less than 10 ohms on a solenoid, it's bad. It's considered shorted. It's likely to blow fuses on the controller. It needs replaced. Now, we get in this range of between 10 and 20 ohms. It depends. It depends on what makes what make it is and configuration because when you have multiple solenoids on one line, the num that number might be okay. But it's 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 certainly in question. We need to we got need to figure out why you're getting that reading. It's that it's probably not right, but it could be. And we say we've spread this out because there's uh, there's there's some variation. One of our one of our competitors has a solenoid that draws or has a a very high ohm reading, and so we're saying basically anything between 20 and 60 ohms is probably fine. But you need to know again, just like knowing knowing your meter, you need to know your system and what you're working with. If it's if it's all rainbird solenoids, they may be higher. If it's all hunters, they're probably going to be in the mid 20s. It just there's a lot of variation in them, so you just you know you need to know what you're dealing with. But 20 to 60, call it good. And if it's over 60, you, you basically it's an open circuit. It's certainly got a problem, and it certainly needs replaced. But, but anyway, so so a standard hunter solenoid will read 25.8 ohm, or pretty close to it. There might be a slight variation with meter to meter, but the, if it's one solenoid on the circuit, that's what it should read. Now, if there's two solenoids together, and that's very common to put to have two valves tied to one line. That number goes in half. It doesn't double. Everybody expects it's going to double, but it doesn't. It actually is half. That's why I had that area that was questionable, 10 to 20 ohms, because if you had two solenoids, you'd be right in the middle of there. If you got three, it's even less than that. And typically, we don't recommend people have three three solenoids on one line, but it happens, and it would be it would be one third of what a standard solenoid is.
And this is helpful if you're testing at the controller because if you don't know what yeah. the, the wire is connected to, you kind of have to find out because if you get um, a 12.9 ohm reading on, uh, let's say, a Hunter solenoid and it's a single solenoid, then it's probably something wrong with it. But if you do know that there's two attached, then that 12.9 reading becomes okay. And DC latching solenoids, if you happen to deal with be dealing with any of them on on hybrid systems or on like our our nodes, um, they they tend to read just about 4.8 ohms. Because again, same thing, could slight slight variation meter to meter, but that's what they'll read. And they'll be half if we've got two of them up to one, also. So this is just testing the testing the solenoid. Let's say we just put meter to either lead, the, the, the leads aren't colored, clarity doesn't matter um, when we're testing resistance. And we just we just hook it up and get a reading and that same 20 to 50 is good. And it, when you're testing a single solenoid, you, you don't have to worry about anything else. If it's outside of that range, um, lower or higher, it, it's bad and it needs to replace. Um, now this is a very common thing to do testing resistance at the controller. And the number one thing to remember is resistance. Make sure you turn the power off first. Turn the clock completely off, unplug it from the wall, whatever you need to do. The power has to be off of the controller. Then once you do, you just hook up the the, co the common to one. And like I say, I put I put black lead to common, but it does not matter. And then just then just touch it to the the terminal and get a reading. And folks, this is the first thing you're going to want to do when um, you get on the phone with tech support, um, whatever company it might be. They're going to ask you to check the, the zone that you, that's faulting at the controller. This is the exact uh, step that you're going to take by reading the solenoid um, on that zone that that controller has been alarming on. And probably nine times out of ten, you're going to find some sort of anomaly here on the station that faulting. So what we're showing you right now is exactly the process that you're going to use when it comes to uh, looking at a fault on a controller and scratching your head and wondering what's wrong with it. You're going to take your meter out and you're going to do this exact procedure here to determine um, what my solenoid is reading out in the field. So we can check, you can check any, any station this way and, and a lot of times, depending on what we got going on, say the controllers blow and fuses, and that's all they really know that blowing fuses, we would probably go through and check the resistance of every station on the controller looking looking for the one with the with the low reading, the, the short that's blowing the fuses. That's very that's a very common thing to do. So this check in three, we can go go the whole way through the controller. One of the things to note for the most part, especially on residential systems, you, the field wiring isn't going to have much effect. When you get on large systems, um, parts, we see it, we see it, with me and Chris both do a fair amount of work on golf courses. We will, we'll be able to see how, how much distance it is out to the valves and back by watching them readings get higher as you get further and further out. Um, just, hey, just for, just for. Dave, excuse me. We have another question. As it relates sure. to the test you guys were doing, uh, it says, do you recommend removing the wires off of the terminal strip when you make that check on the on the controller that you were describing or not? Well, if you can't, if you can't disconnect the power uh, from the controller for whatever reason, it's, it's a very good idea to disconnect the wire. Is it necessary? Um, if you can get the power turned off, it's not necessarily typical, typically. Um, we, I, I know I've dealt most of the hunter controllers that are manufactured and have been in the last decade or so. There's no reason to disconnect the wires if you can turn the power off. They don't give any false reading. Some of the older controllers would give you a false reading from, from some of the circuitry inside. But this, the stuff we're using these days and the components we're using don't cause that. Yeah, so, so if, if you, you can't, if for some reason off, you can't shut the power off, then disconnect the wire. Then absolutely disconnect the wires. But if you can get the power off, you should be fine testing it this way. Thank you, guys. Okay, so continuity, and I told you before, continuity is really a, a resistance type check. 
but they, what we're going what we do in continuity, and it's usually it'll have a, it'll usually have that symbol that looks like a little speaker. It's gonna it's gonna make an audible tone with on a complete circuit with a with a low resistance circuit. It'll be a you'll get an audible tone, and and a solenoid is considered a low resistance circuit. I always thought that was testing my cell signal, Dave. Are you sure? <laughs> it looks a lot the same, doesn't it? The, my, the meter was first, so it's got to be right. You got it. And and another one, yeah, it's another. Th you need to know what your meter is going to show. And typically, when you're using continuity, you don't even care what's on the display. You're just listening for that tone. But in this case, this meter shows shows uh, shows continuity as zero zero one. And it, and it shows an open as, as one with nothing after it. It's again, it's a, you need to know your meter. Every meter is different. I myself, I very seldom use continuity. I want to see, I, I, I guess I'm maybe I'm a little anal about it, but I want to see the exact resistance numbers. See, me, myself, for, I, actually use, I use continuity a lot because, you know, sometimes you don't always know the numbers. So if you can get the meter to ring, uh, tone through, and you guys are, you folks are understanding what's happening here is that when you put it in that in that uh, continuity um, and there's an audible tone to it, it actually sends a sound uh, it sends a, a signal through the meter and then through the piece of equipment that you're you're testing, and it'll actually give you an audible tone. So if you were testing a solenoid, um, if you had a solenoid that was open, meaning that it was damaged to some degree, um, you would go into tone and touch your leads together and get a tone. But then if you went back to the solenoid, the solenoid would not, you know, result in an audible tone because the voltage is not making it through because the solenoid's damaged. A good solenoid will always ring continuity through it. Yeah. Yeah, the only problem I see there is a shorted solenoid will ring ring is continuity. But it's still it's still a shorted solenoid. So now this is where this is where we have the, the hardest time explaining this to people. So we're gonna try Couple different things. Amperage or and amps, like I say, amps is flow. Amps the flow of electrons. And it's a lot like gallons per minute in a hydraulic system. So pipe is to GPM as wire is to amps. It's um, if you think of it that way, this this works pretty good. I was supposed to okay. So so there's where the pressure. Pressure and voltage are, are about the same. Friction loss and resistance are the same kind of thing. And, and flow or current in electric, right? you can think of them as about the same. Um, so if we reduce the, if we reduce, if we increase the resistance, or it, it reduces the current flow. So you see where they're going. So the pressure didn't change. But because there's more resistance, because of the smaller pipe, there's less flow. And it continues like that. Smaller pipe, even less flow. The pressure's still the same. Still got the same number of pressure, same amount of pressure, the same volts. But as, as if the if the resistance increases or the friction loss increases, and the pressure or the voltage stays the same, then the flow or the current have to reduce. And it just continues. So. So we so we use current for for a couple different things. The all the, all transformers are rated for current. This is perhaps a label off one of the smaller transformers. If you look at it, it's 120 volts AC coming in at 60 hertz, and the output of this this transformer is 24 volts AC at 1,000 milliamps or one amp. Um, this is pretty standard for a small residential controller to have a transformer that's rated about like that and if you if you guys are ever trying to uh, match up a transformer you want to read the transformer or the one that's bad to get the exact specifications off of it if you're trying to buy a replacement um, because if you don't do that you're gonna let the smoke out of your equipment and the and the 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 the, the, the voltage and the then the amperage out are the big ones um, never go never go left the voltage has to be whatever whatever you're replacing, and the amperage has to be the same or higher. If you if you have less, if you get one that's rated for less amperage, 
it won't last over time. You'll burn it up. You'll have a failure. So this is just a, on a hunter, a hunter solenoid. One hunter solenoid draws about one, about 0.19 amps. We rate them as 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 a quarter amp or 250 milliamps, but the act, actuality is they draw a fair amount less than that. So if you got two solenoids on a circuit, they draw twice as much current. Remember the resistance went in half, well the current doubled. That's because the voltage is staying the same. And if you have three solenoids, again, it increases another 0.19 amps. And if you got four, and we're, we hope you don't even have three together, but if you have four, it'd be 0.76. Yep, and get so out of control on. now. Yeah, yeah. This one, this one, you'll have you'll have issues with almost any controller if you hook up five solenoids to it at once. So this is the electrical specs on a controller, which happens to be a Pro C controller. So notice it's, it's similar to the transformer specs, and a lot of them, you know, 120 volts AC and 60 hertz coming in. Um. This transformer can actually do 230 volts also. Its output is 25 volts AC at one amp. Now the controller though is rated for a station output of 0.56 amps and a maximum output of 0.84 amps. And so, so here's how it works. So you got a total of one amp. So you got it, we got, we allow 5.6 amps for the station, 2.8, for the pump master valve output. So that shows you station would be, the station output would easily have run two solenoids. The pump master valve circuit would only run one. And then the total is 0.84, which is less than the, the 1.0 amps the transformers rated at. That yeah, means we everything stay right under the two. threshold there. Yeah, we want to, we got to stay underneath the, the max. And we want a little bit of leeway in there. So on a pro a pro C controller runs one station at a time, one amp. So that all works. Per, that all works perfect. Our ACC controller will go to the big commercial controller. It's able to run six outputs at once. So it, needs a, it has to have a four amp transformer in it to be able to handle that. They have six six stations all running at once. Each could have a couple solenoids on it, and this controller can actually run two master valves. So all of that combined, so it has a four amp transformer. In it. So Dave, what yeah, happens so if the Pro-C has, a, has a, a solenoid out there that's elderly and uh, not in good shape, and it, after, when it turns on, it pulls over that 0.56 amp? So you'll have, you'll get an error on the controller if you if if the out if the if the draw on the controller exceeds its outputs. What does the tech have to do when he gets out there? Okay, so so if so if you've got one that's that's in this case and it, it's say an error, basically I would I would turn the if it, cause that's gonna it's gonna tell you what station it thinks it has a problem. I would probably start by turning the controller off and doing an ohms check on that station first. And see what it says. If it, if the reading's lower than it should be, then you know the needs to be replaced. If the reading's higher than it should be. It could easily be telling you that you have a bad connection going to that solenoid or uh, damage in the wiring. And if that, and if all that looked good, I'd probably look at the voltage and see what it says. So, so it's not a bad idea to learn the specs of your controller and what it's capable of doing per station. Right, and that and that's why we that's why we list all this stuff is because it is useful information. Um. And and you, and you'll know if you look at it, like say when it shows you it's got 0.56 amps, you know if you put too if you put too many solenoids on there, you're going to exceed that. We're so saying just keep in mind that like as you see, two solenoids is going to work, but three is going to be um, in, the, in the danger area. So for, as far as checking. Checking amperage, there's a couple different ways we can do it. What we're showing you here is, is a clamp on amp meter. And this is anybody that works on two wire systems probably has one of these clamp on amp meters. 
Um, I certainly do. I know Chris does. Um, uh, and you can use it to check amperage, and they're, they're very convenient. Then that's what they're made for. This this particular meter actually can can be your volt meter too. Um, just at putting the leads in the in the receptacle down in the bottom, and you can turn you can use this thing as a, as a standard volt meter, and it's a fairly accurate meter. Just to, just hook your hook your leads up and and check the voltage and resistance there. Yeah, those are kind of a good do-all meter. Yeah, um, yeah, we really, we really like this one's a, a Pro 93. They discontinued this for a model Pro 94. We really like these meters. They're rugged. They're accurate. Um, that's that's what that's what I require in a meter is rugged and accurate. You can use a conventional voltmeter though to to check to check amperage. And the amperage isn't something we check all the time, but it's useful every now and then. Um, in this case, we can we can hook the meter up in line with the common wire on a system, and we can get the we can actually read the amperage on every station with the meter set up this way. You can do it with the clamp on too. You just clamp around the common wire. Um, now on on the on a conventional meter. A lot of times we're going to need to move the meter lead over to a different receptacle, depending on the amount the amount of current expected. Um, and they'll they'll all tell you what they are. So on on this one, if, if it's this 400 milliamps max over on the right. If you look, so if it if you expect if you got more than two solenoids at a time, you're going to move need to move the leads over to the other side. And depending on what you're it, checking, yeah. and you can take this from me, is that if you don't move it over, you might end up by buying another meter. Yeah, without it, yeah, because and especially on amperage, if you don't move it over, it, it's a real good chance you'll blow the meter right out, and then, and then you're done. 